And then finally, reparations. As Larry tells us, reparations have only been delivered for the racial violence of the past in the case of Rosewood, Florida in the 1920s. In the early 1990s, as he says, the survivors of Rosewood filed suit against the state government for its failure to protect them and eventually won compensation. By similar logic, cases could be filed against various government entities for the racial violence of the Jim Crow and civil rights era, again, furthering the agenda of holding the state responsible. But what if reparations for other harms beyond racial violence? Reparations have also been paid on a federal level to Japanese Americans for their wrongful internment during World War II. Specifically, $1.25 billion paid to ex-internees under the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. Um, I don't have time to review that matter fully, and, and more to the point, I'm hardly a, an expert on it. But I do want to raise several relevant points for this question or this discussion of responsibility. The reparations discussions that took place, uh, especially in the mid-1980s, when the matter of reparations for internment was up for debate in Congress, <coughs> made clear that state action was approved by public opinion, um, in that there was widespread support for internment from citizens, especially in the Western United States thus implicating the citizenry in the harm done and, by extension, responsibility for addressing that harm. An identification between citizens and their government's action that pertains as well to the Jim Crow and civil rights era in the South. The discussion also swirled around the question of the responsibility of the current generation, those who were not alive at the time, in accepting responsibility in the form of having to pay for reparations. One point of view held that current generation was innocent and thus bore no responsibility. The other point of view held that even those who were innocent of any past wrongdoing, by virtue of not having been born yet, could still be held responsible, or at least encouraged to feel responsible, for the status of fellow Americans who still lived among them and who suffered for a past injustice perpetrated by their government, all of their government and still experience the lingering effects of that discriminatory treatment. At its most expansive, the discussion over reparations for internment acknowledged, among other harms, lost income, the stigma of internment, and the breakdown of families, all of which had long-term consequences <coughs> in the lives of the internees, of their families, and the Japanese American community more generally. Much the same argument can and has been made for slavery and the discrimination of the Jim Crow and civil rights era and their long-term effects. Thus, the wider discussion over reparations, and by wider I mean looking to provide reparations for things beyond acts of racial violence, um, the wider reparation discussions opens more readily on the more pervasive problem of current racial inequalities that systemically disadvantage African Americans. Again, the statistics that vary to us. Their historical roots in earlier times and our collective responsibility for them in the present. Of course, it remains to be seen whether politically we can get there from here. If we can get to a point where there can be widespread acceptance of a logic of collective responsibility, <coughs> leading to the political will to take action, whether in the form of reparations or some other form of redress. Thus, the final question for discussion, does the recent gathering of momentum of memory work in the forms of commemorative sites and occasions, of establishing group commissions, of criminal justice trials, does all of this bode well for taking the next and more significant, significant step of responsibility for current racial inequalities? Or simply, or to put it more simply, how might memory work further encourage us to do that work? Thank you.